Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, OSD. Uh, so uh, we are uh, with a great pleasure. We are here to uh, welcome with us our um, uh, expert uh, in artificial intelligence, uh, Dr. Bassem Siddiq. Dr. Bassem Siddiq is an assistant uh, professor in computer uh, science uh, at the ISAT SUS. Uh, he has got uh, the PhD in computer vision and uh, machine learning from uh, Lattice Laboratory at uh, the National School of Engineering of SUS. Uh, his talk today in the BIOT conference is about uh, the artificial intelligence methods applied to sign language recognition, a modality, a modality based review. So uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Bassem. Uh, you, you can get uh, the floor and uh, to share your screen and present uh, your uh, session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wael. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Olfa, for having me. Thank you to all uh, uh, participants out there. Uh, um sharing my screen i hope that you're uh, able to see my screen now yeah it's uh, okay. in progress yeah. Uh, yeah yeah good good okay well yeah. uh so uh, uh actually uh, uh, i was very interested in the last presentation done by mr uh, uh, Juini, uh about phosphate and i really agree that this is a very interesting uh, field um, actually, you could notice from my title, the title of my presentation, that uh, this is a bit different to a way uh, topic, but uh, I can find some uh, key relation elements uh, related to AI. And uh, I've made some uh, little bit, I'll make some bit of uh, changes in my presentation. Uh, and um, maybe I will, when I have something that I think of as a solution, uh, I might uh, uh, give it. Uh, so just to tell you about uh, the outline of my presentation, actually uh, the title is about, as you mentioned, artificial intelligence uh, applied to sign language recognition. And we go this using a review paper actually that uh, was lately published. Uh, it will be modality based. Uh, actually, uh, this is the outline. Uh, we go through the context and motivation why uh, we are interested in AI. Uh, we will talk about the human actions recognition pipeline. Uh, uh, the unimodal uh, methods for human action recognition will be detailed, including joints, uh, RGB depth streams, and uh, something called temporal segmentation. Uh, we will talk about the multimodal AI methods and then uh, deal with sign language uh, related uh, applications. And of course, at the end, we will have some takeaways and discussion elements. Uh, just to tell you a, a bit about um, our laboratory and uh, my background. Uh, actually, uh, I'm affiliated to the La uh, Lattice in ISO uh, laboratory and uh, specialize uh, with working with the team on video analysis and artificial intelligence. Uh, We've been collaborating with the uh, Pascal Institute of Clermont-Ferrand in France. And um, these are some of the other works that have been uh, done in my laboratory. So first of all, uh, artificial intelligence uh, definition. So by definition, artificial intelligence is a branch of computer science dealing with the simulation of intelligent human behaviors. And this is done in computers. And keywords that are related to this include machine learning, uh, computer vision, object recognition, neural networks, algorithms, systems, etc. So these are some, some of keywords that I will be uh, detailing uh, along this presentation. And for now, I want to, uh, to focus on this video. And, uh, and I don't know if you're hearing the sound. There's a lifelike simulation of a toddler. Hey, are you excited to be here? She's actually seeing me through the web camera. She's listening through the microphone. Ooh. Yeah. And uh, I hope so that you did hear the sound. Actually, uh, if I can ask you to think of it, how, how this uh, such an interaction is done. Uh, does it, uh, what do you think of it? Is, is it science fiction? Is it real? Is it something that's uh, available, possible nowadays? Um, 
actually, uh, this is done mainly because the baby and the, this is simulated version sees the person that's in front of him. Uh, actually, also, it recognizes the facial expressions, recognizes the action of the body, and uh, also maybe recognizes the voice. And uh, if you did hear the, vo uh, the sounds, uh, it's also possible that the baby actually uh, reacts uh, with emotions and with sounds, also with voice. Actually, this is a real project named uh, Baby X, and this is using neural networks. And uh, actually, it learns from pictures and sounds, and the response, the animations, are uh, they're just uh, 3D scanned emotions, uh, actually animations. Uh, so you could think of it as uh, the baby could be changed by any other uh, virtual character. And uh, here's how this is being teached. I wanted to uh, look at this. So suddenly get a spider forming in her mind here. She started to associate the word with the image. Spider. Spider. So it recognizes the spider. And you could see that the model is very naive, actually. It doesn't recognize the difference between uh, a spider and the duck. Uh, actually, uh, these are two classes, uh, basic. And we have to feed multiple samples to the uh, neural network in order to be, for him to be able to recognize the difference. Uh, so. This is not yet uh, a very intelligent uh, model, but uh, there are some applications of this and, uh, that are include uh, virtual assistants. Uh, we also use uh, these, are, uh, these uh, characters uh, for interviews, handling, emotion management. Uh, if you are interviewing a criminal, so we could go through simulation in order to uh, deal with emotion management. And these are the different uh, examples. Uh, of interchanges. Uh, and now uh, we go to other applications why we use AI. And if you allow me, I'm going back to the presentation of Mr. Uh, Juini. And I have a video that I've checked there and I want to share it with you. And this is about uh, handling uh, containers, but this could be also thought of as phosphate uh, um, data. So you see here, uh, a fully automated machine uh, uh, factory. And what you see here are, autom are automated uh, transportation uh, four-wheeled objects, uh, cars. And they actually know where to go. They know how to take the things, where to put them. And this is kind of automation that could be done uh, through uh, robotics. Um, there's a slightly uh, Next thing, so we see here the robot, and actually they go through uh, character recognition. They know where to go, uh, and what you see here are the plan, uh, plans. So these are uh, transport elements that are placed on the ground, and they allow these trucks to go uh, right where uh, they need to go. And you can think of such applications of these uh, elements in IoT and in um, uh, as partial solutions to the our I would say, how to improve things in our phosphate uh, factories. And I have another, uh, actually, uh, uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, once again. I have another uh, uh, solution that I thought of. I might take you to uh, the last presentation of here. Uh, um, one of my last slides uh, and I hope that you're seeing my slide. And this is what, uh, so how to get AI implementation. I know that Mr. Uh, Juini, uh, I hope that you're seeing my presentation. Uh, I know that Mr. Juini mentioned that uh, these are costly uh, to make this uh, digitization, but uh, there are some uh, uh, trade-off uh, AI uh, tools that could be adopted, actually what's called the edge AI platforms. Uh, these are uh, hardware that are accessible. You see here the Jetson uh, development kit that allows to get AI implemented. There are some edge uh, hardware that allow, and the idea behind edge is to get uh, AI that is not connected. Actually, this is complementary choice to the IoT. Uh, and you have five reasons for it. Offline availability, you don't need to be connected to the IoT network or to the cloud. 
of course you can whenever you have the, uh, the cloud connected. Uh, you have lower cloud uh, cost surfaces, you have uh, lower connectivity costs as you don't have to consume bandwidth. Uh, you have also confidential information that is stored within the hardware and uh, very high uh, response uh, time. Uh, this is for instance with the Azure servers. These are uh, special dedicated hardware for ultra low latency, uh, high bandwidth and uh, real time access to 5G radio networks whenever they are available. So. Um, um, going back to uh, I hope that you're seeing it. Uh, so can you tell me that if this is working? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, so I these are two solutions that I thought of when hearing listening to Mr. Rini, but these are other AI apl applications. They include uh, racing cars. What you see here is data automation using AI. Um, this is a data center that's behind the cars and it allows actually to get uh, AI decisions about when to change the wheels, when to refill the cars, and this allows actually to win races. Of course there is uh, automated uh, car dri driving. Uh, another application of AI includes uh, bionics that respond automatically to the neural uh, signals of the body. Uh, you have augmented vision, for, for example, to the fire with the firemen. Uh, they could see within fire using augmented vision. Uh, we have also um, uh, smart agriculture. Uh, for example, a uh, to uh, smart uh, transportation and uh, stock management and provisioning systems. And we could also have uh, interaction with robots that could be uh, cobots that collaborate with us in taking on uh, things and also uh, that could interact with us in smart manners. And actually uh, our focus will be in this presentation more on this uh, kind of applications. And this is uh, actually what is our motivation when we did our work. Uh, we have focused on sign language actually. And our game in sign language actually was to, uh, you see here the actor, he's doing some extra actions like we all do all the time. So he's standing, he's taking his hands. But you see after a moment that we then get to the information that's interesting. Uh, this is an action that's not funny. This is Bonissimo. And our goal was to actually segment. We had two goals. Segment the action to know where it starts and when it ends. And also then uh, we have to make the best recognition out of, of all the available information. This includes the RGB, joints, depth, and the mask of the user. Uh, sorry, right. So why we're interested in uh, sign language? Actually, there are 466 million persons nowadays, a number that's expected to rise to 9 million by uh, 2020, uh, with a loss of $75 billion, according to the World Health uh, Organization, because of a lack of services dedicated to them. And also, we're interested because uh, sign language is a purely visual communication manner. It doesn't have sounds, so people, people uh, don't speak. Uh, they use hand gestures, facial expressions, uh, they use the upper body postures. So why not to do this with uh, visual uh, computer vision and AI? This is affordable. Uh, so to do this, we have to know about the uh, human actions recognition pipeline, first of all. Uh, we could do static or uh, continuous uh, captures from multimodal streams. Uh, first of all, we have to think of the input data, what type of data and its mass. Uh, we have to pre-process it, we filter it. We also think of normalizing and synchronizing the different inputs. Uh, we also have to segment the actions to know where they start at the end, what's called temporal segmentation. Uh, then we extract the features uh, with different calculations, measures. Uh, an addition is about feature representation. So this improves the descriptor's homogeneity and uh, efficiency. And we are able to know about the action labels. And finally, we further improve uh, the classification results using post-processing, uh, using, for instance, fusion strategies. In our case, we used uh, Kinect, but of course, there are many others uh, many other uh, sensors that could be used out there. Uh, 
And the dances that we did focus on are uh, coming from a competition named Challer. Uh, it's a competition that has been uh, active out there since 2011 and is still active there. Uh, we uh, uh, started with one shot learning when we have you have only one sequence to learn uh, from, then started to get multi samples. And in 2014, it got large scale. And this large scale enables us to get deep learning met methods out of it. Uh, it's also in, uh, requires temporal segmentation and no sound. So, as you know, sound. Uh, 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 actually sound allows to have high recognition rates and it's not available for sign language, so no sound. Uh, another data set, so you have here uh, different uh, uh, actions, sample actions. Another data set that we did use is the coronal action activity, CAD uh, 60 data set. And you have here a uh, visualization of what this data set contains. These are daily life actions performed by different actors. Uh, we get now to the multimodal methods for human action recognition. Uh, we're going to start with the joints. This is the, I would say, the biggest part of the presentation. Then we're going to deal with RGB depth and uh, temporal segmentation. We start with the joints. So the sources for the joints include, uh, are, could be motion sensors that are placed on the body. Uh, they could, there could be a network of sensors. Uh, and for it for capture devices and we have to put landmarks on the body to detect them and recently with Kinect we started having markerless uh, joint recognition. Uh, the data format could be uh, composed of 15, 20 or 25 joints. These are different dispositions according to the technology that we are using uh, and many contributions have solely used joints in order to have very high performance increases. Uh, up to 29% improvement uh, compared to RGB and depth. And this is a very uh, important source of information. But joints are very noisy, actually. Uh, what you can, uh, when you see, look at these feet, they are not normal length feet, actually. Uh, this is uh, very sensitive information to uh, sensor, height, occlusion, light, and also even the, uh, the speed of the motion. So we need to do a lot of data processing. Uh, we need uh, to focus on the upper body. Uh, we could, uh, for instance, normalize the size when you have different heights and different shapes of bodies. We have to get them to the same uh, normalized size. We could also focus only on the upper body. Uh, this is done by some uh, equations. We have also to filter the joints on a temporal scale uh, in order to be able to uh, get information out of them. Uh, so for each of the different the joint RGB and depth, we're going to see the data sets and the approaches. So here are the data sets. Well, the first one was uh, MSR Action 3D, uh, and it has different test configuration. The most challenging is the cross-validation test where you uh, have to learn from different subsets and test on the other, and you do this for uh, whole data sets. Similar cross-validation configurations are in the CAT60 and MSR Daily data set. Uh, uh, the special thing about uh, CAT60 is it has very long uh, sequences, and you can imagine when you have very long sequence, then uh, the recognition could get confused about the actions that are out there. Uh, we also focused on the challenge, just a challenge named CGC Challenge, uh, and it contains 20 uh, actions relative to uh, Italian language, like uh, perfetto, uh, okay, something like that, buonissimo. Uh, so, and this is uh, this data set is a, is a massive data set with 94, uh, 940 folders uh, for uh, distributing to learning, validation, and test. And the uh, comparison between the different uh, works are done using the test. And how we do the comparison between different contributions of the uh, contributions of literature? Of course, we could use accuracy, but there is also a, another measure named the Jacquard index. And we use this to compare our recognition compared to the ground truth of the action. What you see in orange there is where the action really is. This is the ground truth. And if we have some uh, error, then the error is accumulated with, and Jacquard index actually not only accounts for the recognition, is it right or not, for instance, the action is named uh, FAME or OK, but also the place. And it includes the temporal segmentation. Uh, Finally, about the joints, 
massive data sets have been uh, actually uh, dealing with uh, pose estimation, what you see here, for, from uh, joints for, uh, out of uh, data sets. So uh, data sets like Flick and MPI. Uh, and there is actually a, uh, one of the best contributions out there is the open pose. You see here the result, a very impressive result, whether you have the landmarks for the face, for the body, and also the hands. But actually, uh, as impressive as it looks, uh, we're still uh, not quite uh, having robust uh, actions. So when uh, literature works use the pose estimation uh, solution of open pose on uh, one of the highest, uh, largest uh, data sets, kinetics, only 36 or 37%, about 37% performance is available. So we still need to improve the pose estimation in order to get to action, to recognize the actions. Uh, so to, to improve the pose estimation, there are some uh, new data sets out there that are using synthetic data, like the dense pose, what you see here are synthetic characters. For them, we know about the ground truth and we, uh, of the pose and we could estimate it. Another solution uh, about the dense pose, uh, where we use puppets, 3D puppets, and users are creating uh, ground truth using uh, configuration of the puppets within the space, and then we could label the position, 3D position of the actors. So now about the approaches. So enough with the data sets, about the approaches now based on the uh, uh, joints. Now, um, Applying uh, joint kinematics is, uh, has been one of our uh, contributions actually uh, to the joint uh, um, processing where we know about the bone sizes. These are the different bone sizes. We add them to the model. Uh, we are able to actually improve the uh, Kinect uh, variability in bone sizes and, and uh, make the uh, information more stable. And then we need to describe the joints. Uh, there are some different scriptors out there, like the shape context in 2D and 3D. And uh, we uh, try to use them. So we have the 2D positions of the joints. We have the interjoint distances. Those are the distances between the different joints. We also compute the temporal gradients, like velocity acceleration of each joint. We get also to know about uh, the rotation for the joint in its itself, and also the rotation between the bones. These are the two computation. And we express them in uh, quaternion coordinates in order to um, get better performances. And pretty much uh, most of the literature out there has been doing uh, some of what we did mention now, uh, including the move and pose, then the quadruplets, where we have four joints that are described, uh, where distances are described. And you could see that recently with uh, LSTM and CNN, uh, the same idea is included, uh, is including joint kinematics and try to describe the spatial and temporal uh, actions of joints. All right, so enough with the joints. We are going to the next modality now, uh, RGB. And with RGB, it's a widely investigated field. So we will take talk about human actions and also facial expressions. And for each one of them, we will deal with the data sets and the AI approaches. So we start with human action recognition, HAR. So the first data sets, uh, they were uh, on images. Uh, then we've got to get videos. So these are the fixed images here the chronology, then we get to uh, videos, and of course there are some other uh, multi-view data sets. Uh, what you could notice that as we go in, in time, actually uh, different videos have been adding actions, adding labels, and we get to increase gradually the number of actions, and also the number of samples actually towards 1 million samples and 1,000 labels of actions. This is very impressive. Uh, this is one thing that's provided by the Sports 1 million data sets. And uh, as the performance drop, actually to get this 56% performance, we get the top five correct ones. So if your answer is within the top five, then you are accepted. Uh, this is very challenging. Also a new, uh, I would say, uh, tendency is using egocentric motion, where as you could imagine in the kitchen, you have a camera and you're doing uh, your cooking. And uh, here the labels are actually compound of nouns and verbs. And very new path is uh, actually based on weak labeling. Uh, with internet tags, actually some works 
have been trying to have been able to get 65 millions and 10.5k labels which is really uh, big and huge but uh, they found that did find that labels are very noisy and there is still need an open path for improving how the labels are especially with internet tags uh, now we get with uh, object recognition so when we have uh, rgb uh, we have to tell the difference between uh, if you remember the baby X, I didn't really tell the difference between spider and uh, um, a duck. So basically we need to know uh, the key features that distinguish between the spider, these are the different key features elements, and the duck, these are the different key elements that have been there. And we have to feed lots of data. For instance, for a bicycle, we have to get lots of images of bicycles with uh, the key features that are identified, then described, we have to describe these points, and then we are able to compare uh, to know about uh, bikes. And the more classes and types of information we add, the more interesting uh, solutions we get. Actually, we can, we're able, by defining more labels and more uh, sources, we are able to get to know about street objects. Uh, this allows for uh, instance for autonomous car driving, and we also, can uh, know about, uh, identify, recognize one person in a crowd. And so we have two things. We have to detect and we have to describe about detectors, RGB detectors. Uh, this is one of uh, very used ones, uh, 3D point detectors. Uh, so we get to get uh, compute the gradients in X and Y, and then we compute this uh, uh, equation and we are able to get these points in 2D. And one improvement has been to get these interest points in 3D actually within the time. So whenever the ball changes direction, we are able to fire uh, uh, an interest point. So you could see this for actions. Here, whenever the, the action goes, we, we are able to fire uh, an interest point. Uh, one other, uh, sorry, one other uh, so way to do uh, things is to actually use dense grids of interest points. So we could use all the image. Once detected, we could make the description. So here are the uh, examples of RGB descriptors. Uh, some are transformation-based functions, like for uh, instance, the GABA filters here, 1D and 2D. Uh, and these are some HAR-based uh, filters. We could also make some uh, geometric and parametric uh, measurements. For instance, uh, the body, the face, uh, the points, uh, rotations, and distances between uh, each one to the other. And we could also have visual uh, descriptors, like the histograms of gradients you could see here. So here we have white. Uh, in this cell, we don't have much gradients. And here, where is the, all the motion, you could see that the gradients are very ch uh, changing. And uh, also, we could combine different uh, banks of uh, histograms of gradients, named hog. Uh, in order to recognize uh, complex objects. Uh, another improvement, actually uh, using dense uh, trajectories, is uh, shown this figure. And uh, within the improved dense trajectories, uh, we get on each point we compute the hog, the histograms of flows, the motion boundaries. And uh, this is a very huge uh, descriptor, actually, that has been improved by only focusing on the actor position and avoiding all the other. A later improvement has been done using super vector representation. Uh, we will talk about this later. And this is a very massive data uh, descriptor actually it reduces three times the size of the data set. Uh, you can imagine how massive it, it gets and it requires a lot of data, but uh, actually uh, in our case, this is the um, descriptor that we did adopt uh, to deal with large scale. And uh, one other key information uh, is about the compromise between having local and global representations, actually. It turns out from uh, literature studies that for joints, focusing on one frame is very efficient, while for RGB images using global representations like the bag of visual words, uh, BOVW, uh, presentation is rather more efficient. Uh, so now we get to, to know to talk about 
deep representations out of uh, RGB images. So this is possible uh, using uh, the convolutional networks, for instance. Once you have an image, you could take a per uh, part of it and pull it down uh, and take parts of these new pulled images and make some uh, processing. This is actually convolution, what uh, used to be uh, a filtering. Uh, this is the convolution actually that we do, and we combine all of these to get the final result. In our case, actually, we did uh, rely on Fisher vectors. And uh, the reason why is that, uh, according uh, to many studies on deep learning methods, actually, um, doing um, deep learning is about rising the statistical analysis to the maximum. In our case, uh, we've been able to make. Uh, this statistical order rising thanks to Fisher vectors that are relying on uh, combinations of Gaussian mixtures and uh, dimensionality uh, reduction. So uh, we did a concatenation in our case with, of different Fisher vectors and uh, this allows us to deal with massive data sets. Uh, uh, a short word about uh, Fisher vectors, how they are done. Actually, uh, we, we use PCA for dimensionality reduction, then we whiten the features to reduce the noise, then we extract the K Gaussian mixtures that are the most uh, in, present to encode the data, and then we encode all the rest of the information. We extract the partial derivatives that are shown here, and we normalize the information to get uh, positive uh, high order uh, descriptive uh, uh, vector. Uh, Okay, so we get now to the facial recognition that says on AI approaches. Uh, about facial uh, data sets, actually, you can see that there are uh, those fixed and uh, from fixed images, and those from video streams. Uh, what you see here in green are those uh, dedicated to facial pose estimation. Uh, you can see that we have. 84 points in 3D to be estimated here. Uh, what you see in blue are the most recent ones, and uh, I'll go first to, to the white ones. These are the contributions that are dealing with uh, emotions. We could have seven basic emotions. Actually, they are uh, the neutral, the sadness, uh, the happiness, the fear, the disgust, the anger, and the surprise. And we could also go through uh, the micro expressions uh, to have very focused analysis on uh, emotions. And the blue ones are those more recent, you see the uh, year, and they are rather focus on emotions and uh, new coordinates, a system named valence arousal. And we have, of course, lots of information. Of course, uh, about classifiers, you can see that we started on uh, active appearance models, SVMs, and more recently, we're doing more things with the uh, convolution learner. Uh, one of our contributions in the face related field is uh, presented here. So we create our data set of uh, RGB and uh, point clouds. Uh, we uh, applied uh, eigenfaces using PC representation and uh, classification uh, up to 72% allowed us to recognize the action and to display it. So we see here the result, it's collaboration with a master student named uh, Mrs. Hude Mahmetu. Uh, and once we recognize the action, we display uh, it here. Um, so for those interested in facial expression recognition, actually there are some um, competitions out there uh, created uh, for, by communities like the Medieval community and the iBug research group. Uh, the iBug is uh, the one created almost half of the literature of face uh, data sets is coming from uh, especially those of facial expressions. And the still active uh, data sets now uh, include MLT, FWILD, and 3D MEMPO. And you see here the results of uh, facial pose estimation. This is the 3D MEMPO um, result uh, given by, uh, um, you see here uh, how uh, it gets in 3D. Uh, now, Enough of the data sets. Now we go through the approaches relative to uh, facial expression recognition. Uh, we will do this with a chronological uh, order. So facial expressions uh, got first uh, through the fax system of ECMA. So it defines the seven expressions I just mentioned, and also defines the 35 action units. 
and the action units are just the tiny micro expressions that you could focus on. For instance, the action unit number 45 is for the eye blink. And uh, this is the system used to encode uh, the facial expressions. Uh, well, the first approaches that has been used to recognize actions are based on a Prince-based projection like PCA and LDA. Uh, so we extract the eigen or given this phase, we extract the eigen vectors, then uh, we represent it. Uh, and the weight is used to uh, tell the distance between uh, this image to one of the main uh, uh, dimensions. The next improvement has been brought by active shape models and active appearance models. In this case, we combine the PC representation with shape uh, information. Uh, and this allowed very interesting application like facial morphing and pose estimation. At this point, uh, after that, we started seeing uh, facial detectors, actually based on object detectors, uh, using hard cascades, uh, uh, hard features, and cascaded learnings. Uh, by Viola Jones, we started having uh, localization faces within uh, big pictures that are not really uh, containing only faces. And uh, these detectors are still being improved with HOGS and uh, CNNs. Um, one very important descriptor that has been used with faces is the local binary patterns, LBP. It encodes the micro textures, uh, texture variations and has been done with different orientation thresholds. And uh, actually it has been awarded to CNN models to improve further the results. So you see here that we, you know, uh, instead of using the raw image, we actually pre-process the image, then feed it into the neural network. And this uh, one way to improve uh, things. And I thought that this is time now to talk about neural networks. So uh, we, we talked a lot about convolutional neural networks. Uh, what about them? So the brain actually has 85 billion neurons they receive information, they process it, and they fire electrical responses. And the neural networks and computers are pretty much simplified version of our brain. So they, the more the nodes they are, what you see here for the case of the baby, for instance, and the more information it gets, the baby will be able to tell the difference between a spider and a duck. Uh, here's one of the first successful Convolutional neural networks uh, has been uh, brought by, named AlexNet, brought by Alex Krzyzewski and Hinton, I think. And uh, it successfully implemented convolution and pooling. And the idea about a convolution is that we apply a kind of filtering of the image out of the first image of 20, 28 by 20, 28 by three, and three is the for RGB. Uh, we reduce the size uh, and we take the maximum values and we do this three times. At the end, we get, uh, feature description, and the last layer is for classification. So you have to tell which uh, this descriptor is relative to what. And uh, the next title is one of the very important titles actually for me, uh, from GABA filters to CNN uh, based features. Uh, and uh, this allows, uh, actually what allowed us to understand what's happening within uh, CNNs. Uh, actually, I'll take you back to GABA filters. And GABA filters are those uh, black and white filters that are made at different resolutions and different orientations and scales, what you see here. And they allow to describe the image. Uh, for instance, uh, we do something like in JPEG uh, encoding. And um, actually, these are GABA filters. And it has been proven by Krzyzewski et al. that the first layers within the AlexNet are actually doing pretty much like GABA filters. This is very interesting. Actually, uh, it's about in 2016 that Yuzinski et al. Uh, have been uh, able to generate uh, the responses, the visual responses of the neurons. And we've been able to verify really that these are not GABA filters, uh, but these are the responses given by the neural networks. These are the responses in colors, and these are in black and white. And uh, interestingly, uh, one new neural network that's named the GABAnet. Uh, uh, try to replace the first layers of the neural network with Gabor filters. So this allowed um, the model to converge uh, a lot faster and much uh, similar performances that we have been obtained. Uh, 
for instance, the combination of different layers allows for, uh, one, for one application to recognize the face. Actually, other neural networks, uh, in order to tell you about them, uh, they include the 3D CNN. 3D CNN actually is about taking X and Y, this is the image, but we also take some different frames. So we have three dimensional space. And uh, we actually pull out of this three dimensional space uh, gradually. Uh, we convolve and we make pooling and we, at the end, we get three information about both, I would say, the time and the space. And there are some other specialized uh, networks in uh, time analysis, uh, named the recurrent neural networks and the long short term memory uh, networks. This is improvement of RNN. And the idea here is just you, had the, you get some nodes that relate to other nodes that are present in a different stage uh, of time. Uh, one of the very successful lately uh, neural uh, networks is named the hourglass. It's mainly used for uh, pose estimation. And the idea here is that you get to pull down the size to a very low scale, then you use a maximum, uh, generate back uh, with upsampling the pixels, and this allows for pose efficient, very efficient pose estimation. Now we go to uh, facial expression, actual coming orientation. So as I just mentioned, uh, there's a new system for evaluating uh, emotions based on arousal and violence. And uh, this, uh, as we go for more and more informations and samples, we, uh, we are in need actually as coming orientation for better annotation and uh, also annotators. Uh, one of the other coming irritation related to facial expression recognition is using in the wild images that are outdoors uh, we could use smartphones for this. We could also focus on finest micro expressions like in the mouth, uh, relation between groups, and also soft attributes like gender, age, and emotion. For pose estimation, uh, actually, uh, we know that for bodies, uh, we are able to make dense uh, pose like estimation. This is done uh, in the dense pose, but uh, for faces, we are still. Uh, there's still work to do. And uh, finally, uh, there are some robotic platforms that rely on facial expressions for uh, kids uh, with uh, learning disabilities and with those with autism. Uh, they allow us more uh, easy uh, interaction. You see here that the robot is actually making the facial expression and the, the kid is responding. Well, so we get now to the depth information. This is the depth. Uh, this is a stream that allows us to mimic the stereo vision uh, and the Z dimension that you, uh, we humans are, are able to get. Uh, the depth actually uh, could be generated by Kinect, XTL, real sense sensors, or could be also synthetic. Uh, this was the case with the Shoton et al. Uh, paper that was used to create a uh, contribution that was used to create the uh, Kinect uh, pose. And uh, more recently, uh, most uh, depth-based uh, works and assets are fo focused on pose estimation, actually. And as the, we are having more and more virtual reality headsets, we are more interested in getting the pose of the hands. And we see new data sets that appear here there with large scale data, uh, sizes, like the 1 million hands challenge, and uh, also uh, some uh, multi-view data sets. And you can verify this, that uh, pose estimation is uh, very active in recent, uh, recent years with many contributions. And uh, same applies with scale uh, augment, uh, increase uh, with uh, the other dashes. Now we get about the approaches. Uh, one of the very used scriptors uh, for depth is uh, temporal uh, energies. And you can see them there. So basically, temporal energy is about extracting different uh, differences of motion in time. And this is noisy, actually. In order to get rid of the noise, uh, you could focus on this video, actually. Uh, you have here a discretized face. And maybe we have 64 uh, squares there. And the 64 squares are here. So we have from 0 to 64, maybe. And we accumulate, actually, the energy in time to uh, fully describe in a global manner the, um, the action. We could do this also using point clouds. And here are some of the other uh, descriptors, hugs, PCA, CNNs. We start to see also CNNs applied to uh, depth. And the 3D CNN, of course, we have to take 
n frames and you can think of it as taking n frames is almost almost the same as uh, accumulating globally uh, uh, frames in bag of words so you take a whole list of frames and you extract information out of it uh, post estimation from depth this is the new uh, era I would say and uh, what's interesting to know is that the Kinect sensor is rather optimized for speed not for accuracy and uh, this is using random forest was easier to put into hardware and this is noisy actually I remind you that the sizes of the hands there are not correct some other pose estimation methods are rather exist and they are rather focused on accuracy and they include the kinematic model the use maybe they use point clouds a uh, probabilistic model for the body and they also improve the tracking so it's good to know that uh, joints out of Kinect are not the only ones out there. All right, so what's about temporal segmentation? We have a stream and we know we need to segment it. How we do this? Uh, actually, um, we split uh, once we have a st uh, stream, uh, we have some information that's not important and we need to extract the most important now. So we talk about pre-stroke and post-stroke and the information is in the middle. We could do, th do this heuristically. So we could look at the joint left hand and the uh, joint central. And once the distance moves more than threshold, we uh, fire that we have an action. This is what you see here. This could be done for the right and the left hand. Uh, other methods, so we have the heuristic ones. This is what did, we did present. Some other methods include dynamic programming, uh, which allows to search for a shortest path within, within a matrix. We have also sliding window where we analyze the fr uh, amount of frames, uh, sorry, that uh, we look at some n frames and we, we slide with the padding and then we continue. Some other methods uh, use classification. Uh, we did this with SVMs. Others are doing this with neural networks. And, uh, the idea is to get a binary classifier between if we have motion or no motion. Uh, about SVMs, uh, these are the classifiers that we did use. Uh, so the idea on, on uh, support victim machines is to maximize the frontier of decision between a set of information. So we have to uh, search for these parameters, data parameters, and uh, to uh, in increase the dimensionality, there are some kernels out there. Uh, so if we have small set of uh, samples, we use RBF kernels. And if our samples are wide, very huge, we use linear kernels. And uh, the parameters are pretty much stable in recent toolboxes. So we did use uh, SVMs to actually, in order to get, instead of getting two classes, we have generated four. Uh, the classes, of course, we have the no motion, but we also have motion. And motion, we distinguish if the, this is a left-handed, right hand, or both hands. And uh, you can think of it. If you have uh, the information, the classifier tells you that you have two hands that are being motion, then you can reduce the number of labels to be uh, used there out afterwards for recognition. And this is really effective for improving the recognition rates. So uh, this is our, our pipeline. So we segment, then we describe, and at the end we uh, classify and also regroup uh, the labels. Uh, actually, there is an algorithm for grouping to understand it. Uh, once in these frames, uh, these are the labels we obtain, two, two, three, 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 four, four, four. And you have see, see here the one. And from this group, first group faction, we are able to further segment it. We know that this is label three and this is label four. We are also, we could extract the global label for the action. And we're also able to improve the error rate by uh, accumulating uh, these frames. And we know that this is the action number four. All right. So time now we have seen all these unimodal uh, tools, now we have to know about the multimodal. Uh, so how we do the multimodal? So we could take the raw information or we could filter it. And this is the higher level information. So we take the higher level information and we combine the joints. From the joints, we have the position. From the RGB, we have very rich description of uh, uh, gradients. We also take the descriptors of the depth and we also use the facial expressions. And uh, you can see here the different uh, cat uh, that we did use. Uh, 
and you can see that some of them are requiring both sign language, they, they are relative to sign language, and they require temporal segmentation. So how we could combine different uh, inputs? We could do this uh, by, once we have the features, we could concatenate the features, then do representation and evaluate them. We could make concatenation at the representation level, so we get two separate representations, and then we could concatenate them. Or we could uh, get uh, scores fusion. And in our case, uh, we did find uh, that uh, getting um, representation concatenation is better. And this is what we did adopt with different facial vector uh, concatenations. Uh, some other methods used purely neural network based uh, uh, fusion methods from the right and left hand, and also the joints. Other methods included uh, bug of visual words and convolutional networks. They combined them, and others combined uh, depth and joint uh, features. So pretty much we see the pattern. Uh, and this is the actually the Fisher vectors that we did adopt. This is the concatenation of uh, at the representation level, the different features coming from the RGB, the depth, and the joint. And we also combine uh, this is like a global scale. Uh, we also get the information from the local scale, and we also uh, combine them. There is an optimization process that allows us to get the best dimensionalities uh, that we could uh, get for either joint, uh, depth, and uh, Instagram gradients. We could also optimize the number of Gaussians. Uh, what you see here, for instance, for uh, 64 uh, uh, or 32 Gaussian vectors, we get better, best result for the joints. So this is how we improve the Fisher vectors. And by doing these, uh, this uh, presentation, we've been able to rank fifth in uh, the challenges challenge out of 20, almost 20 uh, contributions. And we had the safety data set. All right. So a bit of focus about sign language. So after uh, actually finishing my PhD, we, ha our, I, we had, we are still have been curious about what's out there about sign language, and uh, we're going to detail data sets and uh, sign language recognition approaches. So, uh, first of all, there are some. There is a first category of uh, sign language data sets that are not suitable for uh, visual recognition. They don't have some con controlled acquisition conditions. They might have the actor that's rotated or some two actors that are speaking one to the other. And the idea in these data sets was to get rather uh, indexation. Um, right, so I think that there are some questions. Uh, uh, okay, so these are indexation more like data sets. For what concerns actual recognition and visual uh, recognition, this is uh, actually, um, most of actions have, have been using sensor-based and like hand gloves or uh, markers. Uh, but when it comes to visual recognition, this is a more delicate task, actually. Uh, the vocabularies become much smaller. Uh, as you have seen in this challenge, just a challenge uh, 2013, we have only 20 uh, sign languages. Uh, and uh, yeah, we start to see some deep learning methods. Uh, to tell you about the data sets, actually, uh, some of very active communities include the Chalern uh, community, but also uh, many works have been using uh, the British uh, BBC uh, data set. And uh, there is a German sign language data set named RT, uh, RWTH Phonics. And this is one of the very uh, widely used data sets. It has 7,000 sequences, but the labels were not uh, all, they were not all labeled. And different contributions have been really working on labeling it. Uh, some of the uh, new interesting interesting uh, data sets, uh, they include, this is uh, the new Tunisian data set actually, what you see here, uh, this is the Isharati Saudi data set. And this is what's interesting about it, uh, why we find it interesting is that this is continuous by seven signers and has about 200 electrical phrases. And we think that this might, it might be interesting to uh, make extra labeling uh, and try to recognize actions. Uh, uh, as far as we know, uh, the Kitty uh, Korean Sign Language data set is now the, the biggest and the richest uh, configuration. Uh, what about research works? Actually, as we said, uh, 
some language is still less developed. Um, so there's no way that we could think about sign language recognition outdoors. We are still within controlled indoor conditions and where the actor has to be frontal to the camera. Uh, also about the sign language lexicon. Actually, there are some extra challenges. Uh, you might know that the Tunisian sign language is actually composed of Italian, French, and Arabic sign language. So we have to uh, combine it. And there are also vocabulary dissim and dissimilarities between the younger and the older signers. And also within the same country, you have different cities that speak different languages, sign language, I mean. Uh, so one solution uh, has been brought by the South African dataset, real uh, Cecil, where they have 6,500 uh, lexicons, and they've been able to uh, collect from the internet 800 signs that they are coming out of there. Uh, about the communities, uh, we find that Caesar Monitor uh, have been very active. They first uh, uh, dealt with uh, TV broadcasts, then they focused on pose estimation, and pose estimation allowed them to get uh, human action recognition after that. Uh, there are uh, a team of Bodenita. Actually, uh, these are not the, the only teams, but we found that they had very interesting contribution uh, for mouth, hand, and then they focused on the full body. Uh, they brought the idea of having two-way uh, uh, LSTM, B-directional uh, STM, to analyze uh, uh, the motion from start to end and from end to start to get better description. Uh, they had also a motion detector based on pseudo hard volumes. And uh, they also uh, recently contributed with, uh, tried to implement natural language processing for sign language. Uh, within a field, a new emerging field named machine translation. Uh, so, Basim, taking you to another question, please. Okay. We, uh, time is running and we have really a lot of questions to answer. Okay, so I have, uh, I think, uh, seven slides. Um, the content is about three slides, I would say. So, uh, thank you, Madam Olfa. Uh, uh, yeah. I can finish them. We have a lot of questions, yes, please. Okay, thank you, madam. Uh, so, about uh, the avatars. So, a lot of applications regarded, uh, concerning avatars. Uh, what you see here is the Tunisian uh, uh, contribution done by Bouzid. This is the three avatar, for instance, Turgeman and Mimics. And one of the very interesting uh, recent uh, contributions is brought by uh, Huawei. So you see here the very attractive character and it has even tongue uh, animation. So this is uh, 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 one of the best of, uh, uh, sign language applications. So finishing takeaways, what we could take about AI approaches, solutions and implementation. So the takeaways, uh, GPUs have been a, a, a key enabler for uh, AI, so you could check on the Colab implementation uh, for TensorFlow, this is available. Uh, you can, uh, we also have CPUs that are catching. Uh, samples are increasing towards 100 million and 1K labels. And uh, promising improvements include uh, streams pre-processing, this is affordable for most of us, we could pre-process, like the case for LBP, uh, where we feed them instead of the raw images for facial expressions. We could also combine two streamed 3D CNNs, LSTM RNN, or even bidirectional uh, LSTMs. Uh, so I want you to, uh, to, in order to, this is the prediction on time. So this is about sound. Look at this. So, uh, but first of all, first, uh, the action was not recognized, the sound was not recognized. Then using natural language processing, the second layer of post-processing has been able to recognize the action. And the idea here is to, first of all, there are two challenges. We don't have the uh, data. This is a hardly speaking person. And also we have to add another layer of natural language processing. And very interesting application include pedestrian anchors, uh, prediction, how to avoid uh, accidents. Uh, we could also predict how things will move in a kitchen. Once you take an egg, what's going to be the next action? Of course, you're going to cook with it. 
Uh, right, so about sign language, uh, this is uh, uh, one of the most advanced solutions. So you have the operator that's actually speaking with a uh, human uh, normal person and you have chat. This is uh, the signal signal application. Uh, so we know for sure that having depth is what enables uh, real-time uh, solutions. So uh, this is going to be uh, measurely for smartphones. And finally, I've already uh, presented this slide uh, about hardware implementation. We could do implementation on the cloud, but we also can do it uh, using edge platforms. And the idea here, once again, is to have uh, AI that is not really always connected, that could be independent and could be, all, of course, low cost. Uh, this is the last slide. Uh, this is the finish. So I show here the references. This is Hinton. And my favorite is Andrew NG. Uh, you could check on its courses on Coursera uh, for machine learning for those interested. And this is the reference for the paper. With that, I thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bassem, for this uh, nice and clear uh, presentation. Uh, we have, as uh, said by uh, Professor uh, Kanun, we have a lot of uh, questions. Uh, I, I, I can start by the first one, uh, by, asked by, uh, by Mr. Mohammed uh, about uh, the techniques that you have uh, presented uh, um, on human activity recognition, the skeleton-based approach, geometric approaches. If it's uh, possible to apply these techniques on uh, facial expression recognition. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, actually, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I got the question, but uh, I'm sure that yeah, of course, getting the descriptors that we did use, we uh, we had some descriptors that are applied for the joints for facial expression. The main descriptors that we did use in our case, the, we had the egg and joints, but uh, now, as I mentioned, there are some convolutional networks uh, uh, descriptors, so. Uh, if I would give an advice, check for the best uh, available uh, CNN descriptor out there. And of course, you have to be aware of the architecture. Uh, what I uh, say, as uh, mentioned at the uh, LexNet, uh, this is a uh, neural network that's suitable for uh, image net classification. So this is the neural network that has been trained for classification between objects. So you have to check for a different architecture, maybe with different pooling and different convolutional layers. That's really suitable for facial uh, expressions or for facial description. So this is the thing to check. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bassem. Another question uh, asked by uh, Mr. Amir Ismail. Uh, he asked you uh, about uh, the application of the Alan Turing uh, system proposed uh, proposed uh, uh, about uh, uh, if it's possible to, to use it and to compare it uh, with uh, this approach uh, based on artificial intelligence uh, what's the, the name of the system sorry alan turing turing alan turing proposed uh, in uh, 17 years ago the system uh, system uh, turing alan turing uh -huh. Actually, uh, to be honest, I'm not sure that I'm uh, really aware of what the Turing uh, system does. Um, but uh, uh, I have to be sorry about this question, actually. Mm -hmm. sure, uh, if, if the person can clear me, uh, yeah. clarify a bit about the Turing system. It is a situation system. where uh, it is better to unmute and to ask the question directly, I think. Yeah, if I can intervene. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Amir, please ask. The Turing system. Actually, I uh, have some insights about the Turing system, but I don't want to uh, extrapolate. I want to be sure about uh, the idea. So, 
So no problem. We can pass uh, to uh, the another question asked also by uh, by Mr. Amir uh, Amir Ismail is about uh, about the performance of uh, the human activity recognition systems is uh, com is similar to uh, human level performance or not? Uh, human action recognition systems uh, yeah. actually. Uh, it, it all depends. Actually, uh, the, the the performance is always relative to the data set and always relative to the uh, test configuration. If you could uh, uh, recall some different measures, uh, I present some of them. Uh, sometimes, if I could uh, get you, uh, so for rapid answer, of course, we're not still we're not there. We're not at the human uh, like performance for sure. Uh, but. Uh, to tell you about the, the configuration, what you can see, I'm not sure if uh, my screen is available here, but uh, you see this is the performance, 93. And this is better than 92 performance, but when getting the comparison with the Jacquard index, where the, you, uh, uh, did you really localize the action? Actually, uh, it's not always the same. So uh, comparison nowadays is always relative to benchmarks. Uh, if you take the best benchmark out, uh, the highest benchmark out there for human action recognition, if you consider, for instance, the kitchen moving, uh, the kitchen uh, uh, data set, we're still uh, uh, not at uh, even at 50% of recognition. So there's still a lot to improve for sure. I hope that I did answer the question. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bassem. Actually, if we, could, if we could check the performance out there, yeah, so we check for the kinetics, 700, we're about 58%. So the idea here is just to keep on improving. For moments in time, we are at 44%. So for sure, we're not uh, as intelligent as humans. Yeah. Good. Uh, another question uh, is about uh, the learning approach uh, in uh, facial expression and uh, human activity recognition. The, we start or, uh, we start uh, from a large scale database and to to learn system etc. Uh, he asked Amir Smail about uh, the possibility to 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 develop a system which learns from small data, then he, he will try to, uh, to enhance uh, their models uh, to understand, uh, uh, to understand uh, the scene as made uh, by the baby. He is, um, as, uh, this is, it's the same process uh, than uh, the baby. So uh, the learning approach, can we start from small data, then uh, enhance uh, the model that uh, we obtain? Yeah, very, uh, very interesting question, actually. Uh, this is very, actually, this is all the, the challenge that there is to be with uh, um, learning. Uh, I would say that there are, uh, from my own uh, insight, I would give two paths for this. The first path is uh, data augmentation. So, yes, first of all, we have to be okay that we need massive data in order to get deep learner networks. So, once you have small data and especially if you have uh, data uh, to recognize that is not within the learning population you could have some small data uh, in the learning and small data on the testing uh, it might work but uh, first of all we need to be okay that we need massive data so how to get massive data first of all we need we could apply data augmentation so this is very common we, you take the starting uh, input information you get and you make uh, some translation, rotation, so some tweaking, modifications on the special information, for instance, when you have a number like two, you make rotations. This is a common pre-processing, I mean, uh, data augmentation. And then you're able to get massive data. Okay, so this is one path. The second path, uh, when you have uh, small inputs or uh, non-available information, uh, is uh, I think of transfer learning. Uh, um, I didn't really uh, mention it a, a lot uh, out there, but transfer learning is the case where uh, you learn from a model and uh, you actually, you take the things that you did learn in the first model and you change the conditions and uh, you make uh, the next model, the next model learned out of the uh, given layers of, when we talk about neural networks, you could consider some of the middle layers and you take them out and make the transfer of the parameters out there. 
uh, different parameters that the neural uh, responses have been generated with, and you feed them. Uh, in this case, uh, it might work when you have small information, uh, and this is still challenging information uh, situation actually. So my answer is two. There are two paths: data augmentation and two uh, transfer learning. Okay, thank you, thank you, Dr. Bassem. Another question asked by uh, by uh, Mr. Dia Haddad uh, concerning uh, uh, the platform. If if uh, there is a platform or a framework uh, that we can use in order to classify human activity recognition, sign recognition in real time. Real time. <clears throat> actually, uh, one very interesting uh, platform. Actually, that I think that I did mention it in the perspective is Collab. Uh, it's not, of course, the only one. There are some uh, other. Yeah, this is it. So uh, you could check on Collab. You write uh, Collab, and this is the platform that's actually uh, online. So you, you don't need to ins uh, install uh, TensorFlow on your machine, and uh, it allows uh, for GPU. You have access. To, uh, what's interesting is that you have access to a GPU with CUDA-based uh, acceleration, and this is all on the cloud. This is for free. Uh, so you could try, uh, for instance, the keywords co uh, collab and actual recognition. I'm pretty sure that you land on uh, the, your first three results, something that allows you to make human actual recognition or any other application with uh, online. But of course, uh, there are some other clouds that allow GPU access and that allow you to... Uh, I hope that I answered. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bassem. Another question uh, asked by uh, Mrs. Uh, Reem Bariul uh, about uh, the challenges uh, if uh, we have an outdoor sign language uh, recognition system. Oh, <laughs> for now, this is this is like science fiction uh, for now, having outdoor science, uh, sign language. Actually, I have my own uh, algorithm to think of it. So uh, actually, there is... Uh, uh, when talking about depth, actually, there are some slides that I did remove when preparing the presentation. There's one interesting uh, thing about depth uh, is that when they are generated from RGB, you know, you have this RGB stream that's captured by the phone and you uh, take, take the different images, you can put the different difference between the images and you're able to generate depth. Could you think of it? Actually, it exists and there is a, da a data set uh, I, I think I me did mention it in the depth. Uh, so stick with me. I'm talking about, uh, I'm going to answer you. So uh, let's go to the depth. Where is the depth? Uh, there is a data set. I will show it to you. Um, this data set allows you to make depth estimation from RGB. Okay. So uh, the depth data set is this one. Uh, okay, so I think that this is the mankin. Okay, so you see this data set, mankin? This is a data set with 2,000 frozen actors. Uh, what they did is that they had some frozen actors. They didn't move. So you get rid of the intervariability of the body, and they have been able to learn the body and to generate the depth out of RGB. So stick with me. You're outdoor, you have RGB, then you have depth. And once you have depth, then you're able to generate a joint. So the higher order information out there. And I think, I believe that this is the new thing to come. Once you have RGB depth, generate joint with it, then for sure, you're going to get uh, action recognition outdoor. And this is going, I believe this is uh, going to be the next thing that will come. But yeah, uh, first of all, we have to get to generate depth. This is the, the main challenge for now. And of course, depth is going to be more and more available within uh, new generation cellular phones. We are, we are already seeing new cellular phones with uh, depth sensors, infrared ones. I hope that I answered. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Bassem. Another question by uh, by uh, Mrs. Uh, Mona Medyub about uh, the means of uh, depth uh, features. If uh, you will be able to give give her uh, some examples. The means. Uh, the means. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that I get what uh, means. The mean, how how to get depth sensors? 
uh, uh, this is my understanding of the, the question. What actually. that means? What that means? Uh, example, some examples of uh, depth uh, features. Actually, depth uh, is uh, a computation at this first level. Uh, if you look at the literature, depth is about uh, computing the difference between two images. This is what we get from the eyes. We've got the left image, we've got the right image, and we apply triangulation, actually. There's, there's a very uh, easy to find algorithm that's named triangulation. And uh, you get uh, the focal point of a camera, and then you're able to measure the Z axis. Depth is all about Z, actually. This is an image, so you have an image. And uh, this image, uh, all what it contains, this grayscale image, all what it contains is uh, Z information. So what it tells you, the, the grayscale is that this is very high Z information. So this is very far. Uh, the, the more uh, white grayscale, I would say, is more uh, close. So this is what the Z and the depth is about. Uh, another uh, another uh, uh, another uh, uh, suggestion uh, to uh, to use uh, FMG signals and uh, uh, another uh, remarks about the collab. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Amelik Sibi said uh, that uh, collab has limited performance uh, when uh, we are using a big data set. So, so she asked about uh, uh, another platform that uh, she can uh, test. Yeah, for sure. Uh, for real time application. For real time, uh, actually. If, if, Instead of Colab, the, the idea is to use uh, actually the available cloud services out there. So you have Amazon Web Services. Uh, so the counterpart of it that you have to, you have to pay for it. Uh, there, there are also similar available uh, cloud platforms that allow to uh, get uh, AI models uh, that are placed on them, and they are available for. Uh, uh, inquiries so they could feed uh, responses uh, but they will be always uh, a limited uh, bandwidth i would say or number of users and whenever you get you get over the number of users you will have to pay for this uh, i think that there is another part, a second part of the question um, instead of uh, collab so yeah. I'm, uh, and the second part of the question i, I think i forgot it um, i we have also another question about uh, the data augmentation uh, asked by uh, Sajid, uh, Mrs. GPS, uh, Alex yeah. Sajida about uh, the data augmentation, uh, if uh, we can apply it also on signal processing to detect sign language. Uh, I, I mean, uh, for signal processing, data augmentation, uh, uh, um, from my own experience, when I did use signal processing, I think when I say signal processing, I think of it as 1D signal. And for from my own experience, when I had to use 1D signals, uh, my my concern was about uh, filtering them and reducing the noise of that, out of them. And uh, this is what most of the formation was about. Now. I can imagine taking 1D signals and uh, augmenting their numbers. Yeah, it might work if you want to have large scale uh, conditions. So uh, one, one idea is that you take some different signals and you combine them in a manner. But uh, I, I doubt that this will be, this, they will, this will improve the, uh, the recognition rate because um, in 1D signals, you have to find a way to add noise to them, you see? So you might take, I, I don't know, you have a signal that's for the hand raise, or you have another signal for the, ha the other hand going uh, another direction. Uh, you may try to combine these signals to get a different augmentation. Yeah, this is a kind of augmentation. But I'm not sure um, if this relates to your learning population in a significant way. So I think my answer is yes, you could augment, but you have to be careful if this augmentation doesn't bias uh, the final recognition. So uh, you're actually you're adding noise to your signal. You have to be careful uh, about this noisy samples, how they are being created. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Bassem, for, uh, for, uh, to, to address all these uh, questions asked by our uh, participants. Uh, ju just uh, to recall our uh, dear participant to, fi to, fill, uh, to fill out the form of uh, satisfaction survey about uh, all sessions planned during uh, the BIUT conference. Uh, thank you uh, for your time, Dr. Bassem. Thank, thank you, you for your uh, patience uh, to answer all these questions. Uh, mm -hmm. We um, now we we will uh, pass to break uh, lunch break uh, and we turn back uh, to uh, the conference uh, at 1 p.m. 50 15 minutes. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good health. Bye.